Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's live astronomy program. My name is Justin, one of the astronomers at the Science Museum of Virginia. Uh, happy to be with you again this week. If you've watched previous episodes, welcome back. And uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, happy to have you on board. Uh, it's always a privilege to have an audience these days, and uh, glad you are here today with us. Uh, if you want to catch up on previous episodes, uh, those are all archived uh, right here on Facebook. Let's head to the video section. Uh, they're all there. By my count, uh, there are 14 episodes prior to today's, so a lot of content to catch up on. But you don't have to have watched those previous episodes to enjoy today's show. Uh, today's show is all about your questions. Uh, some questions that were submitted over uh, previous weeks and also earlier on uh, during the summer when we started our Ask an Astronomer series. So we're going to address some of those today. A couple of notes before we get started. As always, need to thank our sponsor for this series, Allianz Partners. Happy to have them on board. Uh, for the rest of the show, I'm going to be uh, showing you a video created by Planetarium Software, very much like what we use in the dome uh, at the museum. Uh, now, if you've been around our Facebook page already today, you may have noticed that the museum is getting ready to open again next week. So uh, we're excited to have you back in the building. Uh, excited to have you back in the dome as well. We're not going to start shows there immediately. Uh, so I'll be uh, right back uh, with you here on Facebook again next week, but uh, uh, head to, uh, you can see the post right here on Facebook that uh, will point you to our website as all the details on reopening. So we look forward to, uh, to seeing you then. Uh, for now, for today's show, uh, since you can't see our giant quarter acre dome just yet, uh, I recommend if you are able to watch this video uh, at least full screen mode. If you have another monitor, it's nice and big. I recommend it. Uh, you can't see it, but I've got three different monitors spread out here, so there's all kinds of cool stuff for me to see. Uh, let me show you the uh, the cool stuff as well. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, just a couple of news items that caught my eye this week. Uh, I thought it might be fun to check in with some uh, some topics we talked about uh, oh, about a month ago now. At uh, the very end of July, we had a special show that uh, was all about Mars and our exploration of Mars. Uh, we had three spacecraft launch towards Mars uh, at the end of July. And I thought it just might be interesting after a month of space flight to see where they are. So uh, there goes the Earth. There's the orbit of the Moon, a quarter million miles away or so. Um, there are the spacecraft again. So uh, that's where uh, that's where our little Mars fleet is right now. Uh, so they made pretty good progress in the last month. All three of these spacecraft, uh, Tianhua-1, uh, the uh, Alamal uh, Hope probe, as well as NASA's Perseverance rover, have all completed their initial checkouts. I believe all three have done kind of a, an initial uh, course correction. Uh, nothing unexpected, just fine-tuning their, uh, their path towards Mars. And uh, an additional update from the Perseverance rover, uh, the Ingenuity helicopter is hitching a ride on the belly of the rover, has also successfully charged its batteries, and uh, so that's where everything is, is looking good for their, their eventual arrival. Now, uh, all three of these spacecraft have just a little ways to go. There's uh, the orbit of Mars and uh, the current position of the red planet. So uh, all of these missions looking to arrive early next year. Uh, February is when we should again uh, keep a close eye on what the spacecraft are doing. That's when they all arrive at Mars. So uh, we'll give you any other important updates between now and then. Uh, in the meantime, I uh, thought I'd talk about some other things that are, uh, you know, sort of in Earth's neighborhood, but uh, not always uh, right next to our planet. Uh, just like our spacecraft are uh, crossing the gulf between the planets. And there are little space rocks out there that cross the gulf between the planets all the time. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of buzz the last couple of days about this asteroid that's flying by the Earth the day before the election here in the U.S. I mean, yeah, technically that's true. Uh, but uh, this, little, uh, this little asteroid uh, is uh, not going to get especially close to our planet. Uh, there's Earth again, 
you recognize that. Uh, the blue line is the trajectory of this uh, asteroid flying by in November. So it should stay outside the orbit of the moon. I showed you a couple of weeks ago the closest known flyby uh, of an asteroid. It happened uh, just uh, about two and a half weeks ago. That's the, uh, that's the red line there. Uh, now, both of these asteroids, small enough uh, that uh, they were just burned up if they had entered Earth's atmosphere. Uh, if you want an asteroid to sort of keep an eye on, uh, here's one that flies by next week. Uh, so that orange line gets significantly closer than the one flying by in November. Uh, and it's also just large enough that uh, if it does hit the Earth, which it's not going to, uh, it might actually make it down to the surface. Uh, the, uh, the smallest asteroids that can survive uh, entry through Earth's atmosphere are uh, about uh, 25 meters uh, wide or so. And I think that's about how big the one on the, uh, the orange line is. But again, it's not going to hit uh, the one in November, uh, about six feet wide. It's about as tall as I am. That's not going to hit. Uh, so uh, we're perfectly safe from those asteroids. But uh, as I always love to remind people, we should still keep a close eye on them. They're pretty interesting. So uh, that's a, a couple of, uh, of news stories that have caught my eye in the last couple of days. Uh, but there were some things that you wanted to see. So uh, let's address some of your questions. And I found a little bit of a theme for, uh, for this week. Uh, if you've been outside at all this week, you've probably noticed that, uh, well, the mercury is rising. A little visual pun for you. Uh, while I'm being pedantic, mercury has crossed the meridian today. It's starting to set. But in our thermometers, uh, the mercury is rising. It's getting pretty warm outside these days. So I thought I'd talk about a couple of, uh, of temperature-related questions, cover some of that ground for you. I uh, found a handful of questions all related to the temperatures of, of different objects or, or where uh, temperature differences uh, play a role. So I thought I'd uh, address those today. Let's start with a question submitted by Will. Uh, Will asks, how hot is the sun? Well, this question came in a few months ago. And Will, I certainly hope you asked or you watch some of our previous episodes, because I've covered this a couple of times, or at least thrown this number out at you. Uh, the visible surface of the sun is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now in science, we tend to use some, uh, some different units to, uh, to measure things like temperature. And uh, one common one is the Celsius scale. So you can see how these things convert right here in uh, the red square on the screen. That 10,000 degree Fahrenheit temperature is about 5,500 degrees Celsius. And then there's another temperature scale that we use pretty often in astronomy. Uh, that's the Kelvin scale, sun about 5,800 Kelvin. Now, that's just the visible surface of the sun. Different parts of the sun also have different temperatures. And I showed you the different layers of the sun uh, well, probably a couple months ago now. We talked about the, uh, the nearest stars. Uh, so the core of the sun is the hottest part of the sun, uh, that temperature approaching 15 million Kelvin. You've got the surface and uh, the lower atmosphere of the sun. And then the corona, the, the outer atmosphere of the sun, that temperature is also pretty high. Mm, high enough that it doesn't actually fit on the screen conveniently. Uh, now it's not as hot as the core of the sun. The corona, uh, the plasma there, gets in the neighborhood of 3 million Kelvin or so. So still pretty hot. Uh, the, the density, the, uh, the thickness of the plasma in, uh, in the outer atmosphere, in the corona, is just so much lower than the core that uh, things like nuclear fusion uh, don't, uh, don't happen in the corona. So, uh, so different temperatures all across the sun. Uh, if you have a magnifying glass, you might still be able to see the temperature on the surface there. So the core very hot. The corona can get pretty toasty. Uh, the surface, not too hot, not too cold. Hotter than a lot of stars. Cooler than others. All right. So since we kind of covered the sun before, let's talk about something that I don't think I've really covered in detail before. I uh, had uh, a question that is going to involve uh, the temperatures of the planets. So let's look at the, the planets all across the solar system. Uh, the sun is the primary source of energy, so the primary source of heat here in the solar system. And so generally, as we get farther and farther from the sun, the, uh, the temperatures of the planets is going to decrease. So uh, here on this chart, now I've got the sun, uh, is on the far left, it's uh, 5,800 Kelvin degree temperature, 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, then those next two are the innermost planets, Mercury and Venus, 
pretty toasty uh, because of Venus's thick atmosphere. Its surface temperature uh, is a little bit higher than the hottest possible temperatures on Mercury, so that's interesting. Then we've got Earth and Mars, a little bit cooler. And then we get out to the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Uh, those temperatures get much, much lower. Since I didn't label this chart, not great scientific practice, uh, but I will let you know that Neptune on the far right, uh, its uh, average surface temperature, although it doesn't really have a solid surface, uh, the way we measure it uh, on Neptune, uh, at that point its atmosphere is about 72 Kelvin. So getting pretty chilly, uh, for reference, that is about minus 330 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so, so much much colder on the uh, the gas giants, which brings us to our second uh, uh, audience question. This one comes from one Richard C. Uh, and Rich asks, "How much warmer are the gas giants in our solar system than objects in space that are outside the solar system?" Well, uh, the gas giants in the solar system cover a pretty broad range. Uh, Jupiter, uh, its upper atmosphere is about minus 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, Neptune is minus 330 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a range of 165 to 72 Kelvin. So that's what we're going to try and match up to other objects outside of the solar system. Now that's a pretty big list. Uh, that's kind of an open-ended question. Uh, let me get one group of objects out of the way. Uh, all of the gas giants in the solar system are actually colder than all of the stars in the entire universe. Uh, the surface of the sun we've already seen, uh, 5800 Kelvin. Uh, so it's much hotter than the gas giants. We saw that on the chart. Uh, but stars can be much cooler than the Sun. Uh, the coolest star that we know of is one named uh, S. Cassiopeiae, uh, and uh, it measures uh, about 1800 Kelvin. So it's much colder than the Sun. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lower temperature, means it has a different color to our eyes as well. I've covered that in a couple of uh, different shows, but uh, as the temperature of a star goes down, its color also gets redder and redder. Uh, the sun looks, looks basically white to the human eye because of its color. Uh, cooler stars look red to the human eye. So as we zoom in here on S. Cassiopeiae, uh, we say that uh, it is kind of reddish in color. So, so there you go. That is the coolest star that we know. But it's still hotter than all of the, uh, the gas giants in the solar system. So I guess I haven't really answered the question yet. Uh, let's see. Uh, what else could we maybe compare uh, the gas giants in our solar system to? Uh, how about other planets? Well, uh, before I do that, let me just show you a cool fact about S. Cassiopeiae since I had it on the screen. I will just show you that uh, even though it is a cool star, it's also pretty big. Most of the red, cool stars in the galaxy are called red dwarfs, which, as their name suggests, are very small. Uh, S. Cassiopeiae is a uh, Myra variable star. It's also very big. We we're briefly inside of it. Don't try that at home. Uh, if you replace the sun with S. Cassiopeiae, uh, it would extend out into the asteroid belt, almost to the orbit of Jupiter. So it is a big star. It's also a low temperature star. So yeah, I thought I'd throw that in just for fun. Uh, all right, uh, let's compare our uh, gas giants, though, in the quest to answer Rich's question to uh, some of those other planets we have found outside of the solar system. To date, we have found over 4,000 planets orbiting other stars. Uh, so surely, out of those 4,000, some of them have to be lower temperature than the gas giants in our solar system. And there are a few. But you may also remember from uh, a, a few weeks ago, uh, I uh, covered the orbits that these exoplanets have around their stars. And we're going to transfer a bunch of them to our solar system. I can't quite do all of them this way, but uh, we'll do a bunch of them. And uh, you can see that a lot of these orbits are very, very close to the sun. Uh, in fact, uh, a huge fraction of the exoplanets we have found, if uh, their orbits were in our solar system instead, they would be inside the orbit of Mercury. Uh, now, in some sense, that's okay, because a lot of those stars out there are smaller and cooler than the Sun. Uh, so not all of these planets are super hot. That's not unusual for an exoplanet to have temperatures uh, even hotter than any of the planets in our solar system. 1,000, 2,000, up to 4,000 Kelvin is not 
unusual. Uh, the last time I looked, which was uh, Tuesday, on the NASA Exoplanet Archive, there were fewer than 10 planets outside of our solar system that had uh, estimated temperatures lower than the gas giants in our solar system. So it's a, it's a pretty select group. Now, there certainly are objects out there that are cooler, uh, you know, big clouds of dust and gas, they can have uh, lower temperatures, but those aren't really discrete objects like planets and stars. So uh, I would say it's actually pretty rare to find something in the universe that is cooler than the gas giants in the solar system, at least by temperature. There's one type of object that is just more interesting, uh, perhaps more exotic than the gas giants in our solar system. Temperatures can be a little bit warmer, but uh, I've shown you this a couple of times over the last few months. Objects that are about the same, <coughs> excuse me, size as Jupiter physically, but uh, with different amounts of mass. So on the far left, we've got Jupiter itself, the largest planet in our solar system. If you get up to about 10 or 11 times Jupiter's mass, the object stays physically about the same size. It uh, has the same diameter, uh, but it remains a planet, just more mass, more dense. Uh, then, once you cross a threshold around uh, 12 or 13 times Jupiter's mass, you turn into something else. These kinds of objects are called brown dwarfs. Not really brown. I've got it kind of colored uh, magenta on your screen there. They're pretty interesting. Uh, then we get above oh, about 80 times Jupiter's mass, and uh, we're talking about stars, which as we just saw can be very, very hot. Those brown dwarfs are, uh, are pretty interesting. Uh, in astronomy, we'd call those uh, types of objects uh, cool in tem terms of temperature, uh, though the lowest temperature brown dwarf that's been discovered uh, measures about 200 Kelvin, so still a little bit warmer than Jupiter. Uh, but to give you, again, a sense of, of uh, scale, to, to translate that into units that you may be more familiar with, um, that's, what, uh, minus 130 Fahrenheit or so? Uh, so you can get in that neighborhood at Earth's poles. So the surface of some of these brown dwarfs, uh, you know, you'd experience that temperature in Antarctica, which uh, well, I think is pretty interesting. But here's the thing I really want to show you about brown dwarfs. Their temperature, cool. Uh, their attributes, very interesting. We think a lot of the brown dwarfs form kind of like stars from the collapse of big clouds of dust and gas. But there are other brown dwarfs that seem to form an orbit around stars. So they may form from the dust and gas left over in the formation of the stars themselves, kind of like planets do. Now, kind of like stars, uh, some brown dwarfs go through forms of uh, nuclear fusion, or, or they're capable of it at their cores. Not hydrogen, like the sun does, but some can fuse something called deuterium, that's a, a proton and a neutron stuck together, uh, and some are able to fuse lithium for uh, periods of time. Uh, but they also have atmospheres more like planets, and, and some brown dwarfs, uh, we've tracked clouds moving through their atmospheres. We think they can have storms, it can rain on brown dwarfs. Now it's not going to be rain of uh, water like we have here on Earth. No, a rain on a brown dwarf is more likely to be uh, uh, little condensated bits of minerals like sand or, uh, or metal. You can have iron rain on brown dwarfs, which is also pretty interesting. But one thing that I want you to know after today's show is that brown dwarfs are all over the place. Uh, here is a map of brown dwarfs in our general vicinity, uh, the closest uh, couple hundred light years of the Milky Way. So all those pink and red dots I've added to the screen, each one of those is one of these little Jupiter-sized brown dwarfs. And uh, most of these that you're seeing were actually discovered by people like you and me, not necessarily professional astronomers, just people sitting in front of a computer. Uh, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 95 of them that are on your screen right now, uh, those brown dwarfs were just announced this week, all discovered by citizen, citizen scientists as part of a project called Backyard Worlds. Uh, this is an ongoing citizen science project that you can get involved with right now if you want to. Uh, so it's time for one of my favorite parts of the show, when I do science live on the computer screen uh, on Facebook 
for people to watch. All right, so uh, let me get a couple of things moved around on my screen. Get you uh, switched over here. Uh, all right, oh, I was going to make my mouse cursor bigger for you. I forgot about that. Sorry. But uh, here is Backyard Worlds. Here's what their website looks like. You can head to backyardworlds.org, uh, or we will drop the link down in the comments for you as well. Now, a couple of things that uh, this project is hoping to do. Uh, first, is hoping to locate uh, more objects like brown dwarfs in the sun's neighborhood. It also has the potential to locate additional objects in our outer solar system. I talked a little bit, uh, I think last week, about Planet Nine, uh, showed you another citizen citizen science project uh, that is hoping to find more objects in the outer solar system. Uh, and, and all this contributes to uh, to mapping out our solar system and maybe pointing us towards Planet Nine. Uh, Backyard Worlds here may, may discover it directly. Uh, if you want to learn more about the project itself, head to the website. They've got this handy About link here. You can read all the science, learn all about it. A lot of cool stuff here. I'm not going to read that to you. Uh, but I will show you kind of how the science works, uh, how uh, a participant would uh, would uh, help classify the images they have here. So I'm going to click on the classify link here in the top right. Now that is a very strange looking image. The pictures you're going to see here on Backyard Worlds come from a telescope called WISE. Now WISE observed the entire sky in infrared light. And a number of weeks ago, I took you through the entire electromagnetic spectrum. We talked a little bit about infrared light. Uh, it is great for looking at for low temperature objects. So in astronomy, uh, planets, brown dwarfs, uh, red dwarf stars, things like that. Uh, you can find those in infrared light pretty easily. They're pretty bright, a part of the spectrum. Uh, so part of the reason the picture in front of you right now looks so strange is because they have taken this light that is invisible to our eyes and just put it in colors that we can see. And they've done some additional processing, trying to get rid of the stars. Uh, so you're just looking for uh, a couple of different kinds of objects. We're going to do this by playing through four frames at a time. And this might have been one of the worst possible examples to, uh, to pop up here. But uh, so they've subtracted these images from each other, and you end up with usually a slightly cleaner image. Luckily, they've got uh, some information here on the right. You can click on the field guide. Uh, that'll give you an idea of what to, uh, to look for. And in most cases, uh, you're going to look for something uh, like this. This is the kind of thing you're most likely to see. Here on Backyard Worlds, they call it a dipole. Uh, it uh, kind of looks like a black and white cookie, right? So it's got uh, one half of it is black, the other half is white. And as you play through this series of images uh, in most of the frames, it'll be black on one side, white on the other. Within a frame or two, it'll switch. And uh, you can uh, see that pretty obviously in their example here. I don't see any great examples in this real image, so I'm not going to mark. Actually, now nah, it's only white some of the time. So uh, let's move to another one. This is a much better example. So let's play this little flip book, and instantly I see a great example. Uh, does anybody else see the dipole in this image? Go ahead and uh, raise your hand if you see it. I can't see anybody. So uh, I will let you know that in the bottom right hand portion of this image, I instantly see a dipole that I think is worth marking. So, uh, right here, you probably can't see my cursor when it turns into a little crosshair, so I'm going to use the feature here on the website they want you to use, where you just mark this, uh, this object of interest in all four of the pictures. So as it plays through the little flip book, I'm just going to click each frame, so there's a marker on it. So there you go, down in the bottom right, in that green circle, I see a great example of a dipole. Now this one is pretty bright, so somebody may have already seen it. It may be a well-known object. So there are two things you can do next. You can simply click on Done and move on with the project, which is fun. You'll still add to their, uh, their knowledge and uh, uh, help classify all of these images. In this project, though, will ask that uh, if you have the time, and uh, you're willing to uh, do a little more research, you actually follow up on these discoveries yourself. Uh, there's some amazing resources uh, that uh, you can use uh, when you're doing, uh, especially these astronomical projects, uh, to track down the things 
that you are seeing. Uh, so let's see here. Yeah, we're not too far into the hour just yet. So let me real quickly uh, try and uh, and do this. So uh, let me note a couple of numbers. They want you to watch these numbers on uh, the sides of the images. So down here at the bottom, uh, we're measuring one half of uh, this object's position in the sky in uh, a, a coordinate called right ascension. So I just want to kind of estimate what this number is. Looks like it's just short of 250. 0 0.08. We'll call it uh, 250.07. All right. And uh, then on the vertical axis here, let's see, numbers are going up. Looks like this is most of the way to 13.88. So I'm going to call it 13.88. Eight, seven. We'll go down just a little bit. Now, if you want to follow up on such observations yourself, if you're at the About section, you go to the FAQ. They'll give you all this information. Uh, here is what that looks like. Uh, so uh, you can read through the FAQs here, and that'll tell you how to read those numbers, right? Uh, but I'm going to jump on over to this blog post that, again, details all of these de uh, uh, searches, the way you want to follow up on your possible discoveries. And just for fun, let's do a little bit of science live right here on the air. Let's see if I found something that nobody has ever seen before. It's pretty bright, so Probably not. Uh, this is a website called Simbat. Uh, it uh, collects uh, astronomical uh, observations from all kinds of huge surveys that astronomers have done over the years. And uh, what they direct you to do on Backyard Worlds is just copy those coordinates down. So uh, that's what I said, uh, 250.07, 13.87. Uh, we're just going to leave these settings as they were. And uh, the how much of the sky we're going to look in, uh, we're going to look at a relatively small patch of sky. And Simbad is already telling me right here, it's found one object. So I don't think I made a new discovery, but let's see what it is. Ah, yep, that's exactly what I would expect. Uh, this is a star. Uh, it's uh, something that must be relatively close to the sun. Uh, it's got uh, what we call high proper motion. It's proper motion, just the way it moves through the sky. Uh, and uh, this one's moving pretty quick. It must be pretty close to us. So something that uh, some astronomer has already found and cataloged. So unfortunately, I did not make a discovery live on the air today. I was uh, doing a couple of uh, test runs yesterday. I did mark a couple of objects that did not come up in this search. So uh, stay tuned. If I get notified that I discovered something yesterday, uh, you all will be the first to know. So, so stay tuned to future episodes. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see if we can get back into uh, to Digistar here. Oh, I should at least submit my, uh, my possible discovery. Uh, so I'm going to just copy that, and I'm going to let them know that I also observed this already known star. So we'll jump into the project. I'm going to go into the talk section, and I'll write my notes after the show. I'll subject you to that. Uh, all right, uh, so let's get back into Digistar here. Uh, I need to get back to my controls, and uh, let's get on to our last couple questions. The other two I wanted to do today, pretty quick, uh, so my live excursion to citizen science uh, won't, uh, won't make us run too late. Uh, all right, uh, last questions, a pair of questions for you. The next one was submitted by June. Uh, June asks, what are the rings around the planet Saturn? Uh, well, June, interesting question. Uh, I think I definitely visited Saturn way back at the beginning of the series. I think it was the second week uh, we talked about the gas giants in our solar system. I'm pretty sure I flew into the rings then. It's one of my favorite places to go. So let's revisit it. Uh, now, the rings around Saturn are, uh, are pretty famous. They are pretty impressive to look at. But uh, one thing that I do want to make sure I say today is that all of the gas giants in the solar system have rings around them. Uh, Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune, they all have rings. Now, the rings around those planets are uh, a bit thinner. Uh, they're a bit dustier. So they're darker in color. They're tougher to see. Uh, the rings here have a lot ice. So that makes them a little bit easier to see from uh, from Earth. So even if you have a little telescope, you can see the rings for yourself. And, and you know, June, maybe you have seen the rings. That's why you asked about them. If you see them through a telescope, they'll look almost solid. But uh, 
they aren't really solid objects. It's not a solid ring of ice going around the planet here. If I can get them just lined up on the screen, I can almost make them disappear. And then if we get just a little bit closer, we'll be able to see what these rings are made out of. So I'm going to zoom right in here. And June, we can see that uh, there are lots and lots of little bits of stuff. Billions and billions of little pieces of rock and dust, and of course, little particles of ice as well. It makes these rings pretty easy for us to see. So they circle all the way around the planet, and there's just so many little pieces here that uh, makes it pretty easy for us to see. So uh, that's what the rings of Saturn are. Now, uh, while we're out here, uh, I do also want to mention this. Um, the, uh, the gas giants aren't the only objects that have rings going around. In fact, there are some small objects here in the solar system that, uh, that have rings. Well, let me add those to the screen for you as well. Uh, there is a dwarf planet as well as a couple of smaller asteroid-like objects. They orbit in the outer solar system, so uh, we call them centaurs. Uh, but these objects have rings going around them too. Uh, I wanted to bring this up today simply because earlier in the week, uh, if uh, you really get into uh, uh, niche topics in astronomy, uh, you know that we passed the anniversary of Pluto being reclassified as a dwarf planet. We talked about that a week or two ago as well. And uh, that's also when the largest object you're seeing here, Haumea, was classified as a dwarf planet as well. So uh, we've got a dwarf planet here with rings. We've got a couple of little uh, centaurs with rings. And all these worlds are out in the, uh, the outer solar system. So big worlds can have rings going around them. Little worlds can have rings going around them. And so the, uh, the size of an object doesn't necessarily define uh, all of uh, the interesting features it is able to acquire. So I can have fascinating processes going on on planets with rings, you have fascinating things going on uh, that give small objects rings. And perhaps the more interesting question, or another interesting question, would be how do these little worlds get rings? It's a little bit easier to explain for big gas giants. They attract all kinds of objects. Uh, they can have dozens of moons. Maybe these moons collide with each other, and then the, uh, the debris forms uh, uh, rings. But these small objects, they won't really gather other objects around them. That's probably not how their rings form. Uh, in fact, uh, their, uh, their rings may form when they get close to large objects like gas giants. Perhaps those, those objects here that uh, I highlighted their orbits uh, kind of in the pink color, uh, those small objects with rings, they're named Chiron and Cariclo. Uh, you can see how their orbits cross paths with the gas giants. So, so maybe what happened is one of these little worlds got just close enough to Saturn. Or, or Uranus for uh, the gravity of a gas giant planet to start to pull ice off of the surface of one of those little worlds. Now, as uh, Chiron or Cariclo escaped the, uh, the gravitational control of, uh, of this gas giant planet, some of that icy debris followed along, and then that debris formed into a ring on its own. Uh, it's perhaps a, a more interesting story than how the gas giants got there rings. So still something that uh, that we are trying to uh, to figure out. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a question that we still like to answer. And maybe one way we could answer it is if we had more spacecraft exploring the outer solar system. We just don't fly spacecraft out here all that often. So, uh, you know, we, we've never seen Cariclo or, or Chiron or uh, Haumea up close. So we've got a lot of unanswered questions about those worlds. One challenge to getting spacecraft out here is, is certainly keeping the spacecraft working for uh, the decades that you might need to get to your targets and learn everything you can. So uh, I had one other question queued up for you already today from Jack. And uh, Jack asked, when does a spacecraft run out of power? Wow. Well, uh, as usual, there are a couple of ways I can answer that question. And uh, it really does depend on where you are. If you're in the inner solar system, if you're studying the planets, Mercury through Mars, or, or asteroids in the asteroid belt, really about out to the orbit of Jupiter, you can use solar power. Now that's 
pretty incredible, right? You use solar power in space, and uh, if you're just getting your energy from the sun, well, that's going to be around for another four and a half billion years. So you basically got unlimited power, right? Not quite. So you've got to make sure that you can actually get that sunlight onto your spacecraft and uh, transform into useful electricity for your scientific instruments. To do that, our spacecraft use solar panels. Uh, here's a spacecraft named Dawn. I talked about it a couple of weeks ago as well. And you see those two long wings that uh, stretch off of the, uh, the spacecraft? It certainly doesn't need wings like that to, uh, to fly through space. Those are just long panels that uh, it's solar panels are attached to. So if it keeps those panels pointed towards the sun, Dawn could continuously collect sunlight, uh, solar panels, uh, then turn it into electricity that uh, its instruments can use. But as Dawn traveled through space, it, it orbited two different objects, so the asteroid Vesta and the dwarf planet Ceres, those on your screen when we first approached. Uh, it has to constantly reorient the spacecraft to uh, both study the worlds it's, uh, it's orbiting, as well as keep the solar panels pointed towards the sun. And to do that, Dawn used some fuel. Just like yeah, a lot of us need gas in our cars to drive around, uh, Dawn and most of our other spacecraft need some kind of fuel to uh, decide which way the spacecraft is pointing. So you only have so much of that. You're going to run out of that fuel eventually. And when you run out of fuel, that's when you can no longer keep your, uh, your solar panels pointed towards the sun. And that's when you run out of power. This happened to Dawn a couple of years ago. In fact, it happened to two spacecraft within about 24 hours of each other. Uh, Dawn and the Kepler mission that found a bunch of those exoplanets, they both ran out of power for the same reason uh, at the end of October uh, a couple of years ago. So, so that's one way it can happen. But there's another way. If you're exploring out in the outer solar system, uh, kind of like I wanted to go explore those, uh, those centaurs and those dwarf planets with rings in the outer solar system, you need another way to power your spacecraft. And for that, we should visit another spacecraft. So let's leave Dawn behind here, and let's track down a more distant spacecraft. In fact, let's go to our most distant spacecraft. Uh, that would be a, a spacecraft uh, which is coming up on the anniversary of its launch. Next week will be the 43rd anniversary of Voyager 1's departure from Earth. In those 43 years, this has flown by two of the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. It's uh, crossed outside of the sun's magnetic field, I like to think of as its extended atmosphere. It's, it's beyond the limits of uh, the sun's solar wind. It has entered interstellar space. In fact, that anniversary was uh, earlier this week as well. It's been in interstellar space for, uh, for eight years now. So it's certainly not using solar panels. When we get out here to the Voyager 1 spacecraft, you don't see those big solar panels sticking out of the spacecraft like we did at, uh, at dawn. Most of the little things you see sticking off of Voyager here are instruments. So it's got uh, uh, big long booms sticking out of it that it used to measure magnetic fields. It's got some other antennas used for uh, various plasma experiments. Another boom has its cameras attached to it. So, so no solar panels here. How did the Voyager spacecraft and other spacecraft in the outer solar system get power? Well, let's get a closer look and uh, see if we can figure it out. So let's see here. That's the instrument boom, antennas, camera boom. Ah, I see it. It must be this thing here. So I'm going to try and sort of match our rotation speed with the spacecraft so the features don't move on the screen so much for you. So, uh, up top here, we've got a little arm sticking off the spacecraft, and you might be able to see three different cylinders that uh, are sticking up off of the top of our view here. Each one of those is something called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator or RTG for short. Uh, so these are what uh, the Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 1 and 2, as well as spacecraft like New Horizons, uh, the Cassini spacecraft that was exploring Saturn, even some of the rovers we send to Mars, uh, they are using uh, power cells like this. Now, uh, how does an RTG work? Well, uh, it is using a radioactive element. In the case of the Voyager spacecraft, uh, it was plutonium. Uh, now, 
plutonium is uh, radioactive and as the plutonium decays it releases heat and uh, what this device does is it takes that heat it runs it through other devices called thermocouples which uh, take uh, a difference in temperature and uh, uses that to create a uh, flow of electricity so we're simply using a change in temperature uh, to generate electricity now, uh, a radioactive element decays over time. We send a bunch of plutonium into the outer solar system with these spacecraft, and about half of it decays every 88 years or so. Uh, so, Voyager 1, coming up on 43 years since launch. That's about half of 88 years, so uh, man, it should have a bunch of its plutonium left, right? Well, yeah, a lot of it's still there, but as more and more of it decays, uh, the temperature in the RTG goes down, and it generates less and less electricity. So every day, every hour, every second since Voyager 1 left Earth, it's had less and less electricity flowing through its circuits. So, after it was done exploring the planets, uh, by the early 90s, uh, power was uh, was dropping enough that they started turning off instruments. They turned off the cameras first because there was nothing else for it to see. And they started turning off other instruments, and now they're basically down to uh, just measuring uh, the plasma, the, the charged gas around the spacecraft. And in another five to ten years, enough additional plutonium will decay, there won't be enough power on the spacecraft for Voyager to power any of its instruments. So, Jack, that's when Voyager 1 is going to run out of power, when enough of its plutonium decays that uh, the temperature gets low enough in that RTG that uh, it can't make electricity flow through its circuits any more. Uh, same thing happens to all spacecraft that are powered this way. Uh, it might be a spacecraft in the outer solar system like this, uh, but you know the power can last decades. Uh, Voyager 1 and 2 probably run out of power in the next 5 to 10 years, as I said. Uh, the New Horizons spacecraft, I've, I've mentioned that a couple of times here, uh, that's going to last probably into the 2030s, is, is what they estimate. Uh, I haven't seen the uh, the estimates for spacecraft like uh, the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers. They use these uh, these same kinds of, uh, of uh, electricity electricity uh, uh, generating devices, uh, but you know, probably decades for those rovers to operate on Mars as well. But uh, just waiting for the power to drop enough in those uh, those spacecraft for uh, the uh, the temperature to go down in their RTGs, and uh, that's how they uh, that's how they run out of power. So uh, so long lives for these spacecraft. They can travel great distances, and they can show us some pretty amazing things. All with the power of a little change in temperature. Uh, so you go. Know, there are our uh, temperature questions for the day. But uh, we had uh, another question come in today. Let me read this question from Chase real quickly. Let me see if I can give some immediate advice. Uh, Chase asks, um, uh, yeah, so it's been hot lately. <laughs> That's certainly true. Uh, Chase points out it's also been pretty humid. That's not unusual around here. Uh, so Chase has been using binoculars to do uh, some observing, and they get fogged up pretty quickly, which certainly makes it seem a little less amazing when uh, yeah, the, uh, the view gets extra fuzzy. Uh, so what are some uh, things you can do to help this issue when it comes to binoculars? Well, uh, one thing you can do is... Uh, uh, it should work in uh, high temperatures as well. One thing I remember doing in the winter, uh, when I lived in a place where it actually got cold, uh, was if you're going to do some observing with telescopes or binoculars, uh, you go out, you put the uh, device, uh, your, your equipment outside, a little bit early. Uh, give the binoculars or telescope at least 30 uh, to 45 minutes to, uh, to kind of acclimate to the outside temperature. You're probably taking your binoculars from inside to outside if you try and observe right away, yeah, it can fog up. I mean, for any of us that wear glasses, it's the same kind of thing, right? Uh, if you've got your air conditioner going inside, uh, it's uh, maybe in the low 70s, maybe in the high 60s inside. You go outside where it's uh, 90 to 100 degrees, high humidity. Uh, the glasses are going to fog right up too, but if you're outside for a little while, that fog goes away. So uh, that is my first bit of advice. Uh, just give yourself uh, and your equipment a little bit of time to uh, get used to the weather outside before you do your observing. Uh, I have I haven't tried it with uh, binoculars because generally 
a bad idea to uh, apply substances to telescope mirrors, uh, but there may be uh, uh, substances you can add to binoculars, uh, anti-fog coatings, things like that, uh, but I would just try uh, giving them 30 to 45 minutes to acclimate to the temperatures first. Uh, I'll do some additional research since that's just the off the top of my head answer, uh, and if we have anything else for you, Chase, we'll uh, let you know in the comments as well. Uh, that goes for anybody else that, uh, that has questions, either as a, a result of today's show, uh, or uh, if you've seen a strange thing in the sky lately, if you have any questions about what's going on in uh, the solar system or the rest of the universe, just uh, just send those our way. Add those to the comment section down below this video. Uh, I'll check this, uh, this video throughout the week. If you come up with something in a couple of days, feel free to add it right here as well. And uh, then, of course, as a reminder, if you're interested in joining us back here in the museum next week, uh, check out that post on our, uh, our profile here on Facebook. That'll take you to all the details on our website. Uh, so until next week, uh, look forward to uh, seeing your new questions here on Facebook. Uh, look forward to seeing you for next week's show uh, next Thursday, 2 p.m. Uh, tune in again. Uh, have more content for you. And of course, looking forward to seeing you back in the museum when we're able to open our doors. Thanks for tuning in today, and until next week, stay safe.